but there's thought put into the arrangement of the color blocks. There's something that leads our gaze in to that center area of Gertrude's face. And I do think that her, um, he would have been aware that she'd been born here in Pittsburgh. And I do think that that would have been important to him. Very interesting. So did he, did he work from photographs when he was doing these portraits? Yes, yes. Uh, these would have been source photographs. That, and this was true throughout Warhol's career. Uh, for example, with the very famous Marilyn Monroe, uh, silk screens that Warhol did. We have in our um, archival collection, the original photo, and it's a publicity photo from the studio that Warhol used, but it's Marilyn from top of her head to sort of middle of her torso, and Warhol draws an ink box just around her face. So he's zooming in on that incredible Marilyn Monroe face, and Throughout his career, he uh, tended to just use stock photography, things that were ripped off from a newspaper or a magazine. In these cases, probably historic illustrations. Um, there was one exception with his commissioned photograph. If you uh, commissioned Warhol to paint your portrait, you would have gone to the factory. And if you were a lady, you would have been given a full face of white makeup overexposed with a lot of light. And guess what happens? All of our wrinkles disappear. So uh, in that case, Warhol was taking the original photograph or the original Polaroid in this case, and um, was quite engaged with the client. But there's a big sort of conceptual and emotional distance from uh, these sorts of images where this is not Warhol's world. Obviously, he was not Jewish. And also the source material was quite remote from him. Such as the, the photographs that he's working with? Yeah, exactly. So they would have taken, you know, I don't know where this image of Freud comes from, but it looks like it's probably taken from some uh, scholarly publication. And they would have just taken that to a silkscreen printer had it rephotographed, and then uh, the image transferred onto a silk screen. What was Feldman's background? How did he start working with Warhol? Uh, he, you know, he was an up and comer. Uh, Feldman, you know, I represented him as being all about commercial interest and selling, but he'd actually uh, represented some kind of Difficult artists, Joseph Boyce, for example, uh, was represented by Feldman. And Joseph Boyce, in particular, was a great hero to Orville. Both Boyce and Marcel Duchamp were just these dazzling figures in uh, the art world for Orville. Uh, Duchamp had come well before, but Boyce uh, and Warhol got to know one another a bit. And uh, Warhol actually painted Boyce's portrait, which is in our collection, um, multiple times. So it was likely that it was that relationship of Warhol going to the gallery and seeing Joseph Boyce shows at Ronald Feldman that was the kind of entree to their relationship. It's very interesting. How long did the series take? Did he start by knowing he was going to do 10 or did he, when he finished, no, I think, it, I think that it was entirely an idea, a concept of, Andy, why don't you paint these portraits of great Jewish people? And I, I think that um, it took, a, as I recall, about a year. But the, um, you know, Warhol never liked to be, he probably would have accepted if you said, Andy, I want 10 portraits and here are these people. But he, he was also a little bit naughty. So he kind of at the end would do whatever he wanted. Um, he did take a lot of direction from Feldman, but I would imagine he also felt the freedom to make changes and it evolved over time. And then Feldman packaged it. Uh, and 10 probably seemed like a good number. 10. That's, it's nice. I noticed that there's different styles. Here you have 
you know, the four panes of uh, repetition, and then you have the single, and then blocks of color. Mm -hmm. So do you think there was any, any reason why he chose each one? Well, as that is a good question. Um, I can only relate it to Warhol's portraiture practice, his commission portraits. And in the commission portraits, you see a lot of color, like gold in my air here. And um, this is the kind of color that Warhol was known for, that often uh, kind of celebrity portrait sitters would want. But if you go back a slide and look at Einstein, um, when Warhol was painting portraits, if he painted an artist, they were given a kind of special status. And the portraits of artists, his fellow artists in New York, tended to be monotone or black and white. So we don't know, but maybe um, some of these people were so exalted in Warhol's view of them that they didn't need all of that color. And I certainly think that um, there's something quite beautiful about the black and white or the monotone uh, prints. And that's what we saw in his commercial portraits. You see a sea of color and then suddenly someone in black and white. And that's always an artist or somebody who he has special regard for. So you feel like the black and white might have had a more serious tone to them? I am certainly making uh, my own assumption. Warhol never said that. Mm -hmm. But um, if we think about Einstein and Kafka and uh, there's one other one here. If we Freud. Go forward. Uh, Freud, yeah. And Freud, of course. And Freud would have been especially interesting to Warhol uh, because Warhol was interested in analysis, even though he never went through it, and also psychology because uh, we don't have them here in this presentation, but Warhol famously, uh, a few years after this, produced his uh, Rorschach ink blot paintings. And the ink blots are really fascinating. Hey, Lena, if you're on the line and you have access to NetX, could you pull up some uh, ink blots for us to look at? Let me see. I'm going to put this on stop share for a moment. Lena may be able to do that for us. It's, uh, I'm asking her without preparation. But, you know, the ink lots were fascinating because Warhol was in, engaged in, with an ink blot, as you all know, you're supposed to look at the ink blot and then say what you see in it. And based on what you see, it's a kind of insight into your own psychological uh, practice. So uh, Warhol made his own ink blots. He said that they were surprisingly hard to make and to make them look good. I um, just found it. Hang on one second. Okay. Um, they're small images. Can you see anything from my screen? I don't know that you've started sharing it. Oh, here we go. Sure, that's a great one. Um, so you can see it looks like a, a regular Ink blood. If you look over to the left and see that one from Christie's, uh, it you know I'm seeing seahorses, for example. So what does that mean? But I don't think that Warhol was really uh, thinking I'll analyze myself through making these ink blots. He he loved, I think, rather abstraction that wasn't really abstraction. You know, you can, uh, the gold one is very beautiful if you can click on that. Uh, we have two gold ones, I believe. The, what he, what he was doing, he did this again with camouflage, his camouflage series, is I'm going to make a painting that looks like an abstract painting, but it's actually a painting of a real thing. You know, camouflage is a real thing. An ink blot is a real thing. Um, he did a shadow series. Well, a shadow is a real thing, but Warhol is turning it into a rather abstract painting. So this is the kind of work that's happening at the same time as the um, 
10 portraits of Jews of the 20th century. So Warhol is engaged in very commercial practices, uh, things that are very direct, but he's also engaged in things that are super sophisticated and playing a lot of conceptual games. So you said the, you know, the verdict on these when they first came out, it was not successful critically, not critically acclaimed, you said. No. They were, if I'm not mistaken, weren't they the same year um, put up on exhibit? Yes, uh, at the Jewish Museum, I believe is where it, their exhibition history started, but I'd have to look into that. Um, and again, I don't put a huge amount of credence into the idea that they were not uh, critically acclaimed because as I said, Warhol didn't do well with the critics. Uh, Hilton Kramer, who you may have heard of, was one of the most reactionary art critics. Uh, he wrote for the New York Times and he hated everything that Warhol did. Um, but he talks a little bit about exploitation of the subjects. Um, I don't know that I would say that these subjects have been exploited in terms of being included. I just don't know that the kind of the artist's connection with them is that deep. Now that doesn't mean that we as viewers can't look at them, find them beautiful, and find them really laudatory of these people and one aspect of these people, which is that they were all Jewish. But that's very much true of a lot of things that Warhol did. You know, if we think about his um, Elvis canvases, we have a beautiful Elvis 11 times, and it starts off almost photographic on the right side. By the time it gets to the middle of the canvas, the silk screen kind of moves and you give a double Elvis. Uh, and then by the end, the silk screen's not been uh, cleaned. So you get to the end and Elvis just sort of fades away into the silver ether. Now, did Warhol intend any of that? No, I think that he was silk screening and he made some mistakes. But the great thing about Warhol is he's not didactic. He doesn't say, this is what it's supposed to mean. So it allows us as viewers, for me, for example, with our beautiful silver Elvis, to read into, all, into it with all sorts of uh, meanings, that fame distorts people, that fame is grotesque in a way. And then of course, as we know, even the most famous people just fade into memory and are lost to history. So with Warhol, I think that a distance from the subject doesn't diminish necessarily our ability to appreciate it. I agree. That's very interesting. So the, one of the comments was that he was exploiting these There's, subjects in the series? Uh, there was that. But uh, the Village Voice said that. The New York Times said that. Uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer uh, said that. But I think it was, you know, I think it was easy to criticize this series, but, you know, Warhol did a series on cowboys and Indians. How remote was Andy Warhol from a cowboy? I mean, he, he did make a sort of cowboy film, but called Lonesome Cowboys, but in it, all the cowboys started having sex together. So it was certainly not a traditional uh, cowboy movie. So I think that, um, Warhol in many of his series was quite remote from the subject and had he not been um, but you know one just can't imagine Andy Warhol sitting down and convening a committee as we would probably have an artist do today if they were going to make a series like this that just was not who he was he was much more casual than that did he have anything to say? Was he interviewed at the time when the series came out? No, not interviewed. And he never, if, if somebody criticized Andy, he'd say, oh, you're right. Okay. So uh, he, he never tried to really defend himself. Uh, he, he'd always say, oh, that's, that's right. You, you understand. And it's this remarkable way of kind of cutting through criticism if you just agree with it. It's, uh, you know, he was 
very smart, very savvy with that sort of thing. I think it's also a sign of, we could call it today, maybe inclusion. I mean, he was not Jewish himself. And, you know, the question is, I know it was a commercial aspect to this. Was there a personal interest in it, do you think, or was it strictly commercial? Well, certainly Andy had been around loads of Jewish people during his many years in New York. Uh, some of his early dealers were Jewish, uh, and he was part of a very sophisticated world where uh, the Jewish people were at the very center of art and culture uh, in New York City when Andy was working there. So uh, he would have definitely appreciated and known many Jewish people, but I, I can't honestly tell you that he had an agenda here that he was after. I think that somebody made a good suggestion and he took it. It's very interesting. It's amazing that it was, you know, not critically acclaimed, but almost immediately had a show and then almost immediately a commercial success. How many of these did he make in the series? You know, that one, I would have to look up for you how many are in these, this series. I mean, was it a lot or? You know, print portfolios, a good print portfolio, a really good one will be about 75 or 100 editions. Um, with these, Feldman, as I recall, uh, made quite a few, so probably more like 250 to kind of make the numbers work out, which is a little bit high in terms of a print portfolio. But uh, Warhol's prints are interesting because they are, they're not kind of just representations of the paintings. It's not like a cheap way to do the same image as uh, in a print as in a painting. You know, Warhol from the very beginning of his career wanted his work to be accessible. He wanted to repeat images. He liked, you know, it's why when he went into a grocery store or looked at a magazine, he loved Coca-Cola and Brillo, because if you're a super rich person or a very poor person, you still got the same Coca-Cola. So this idea of democracy and um, expanding the audience for fine art was important to him. I think it's why he also made television shows and started a magazine and managed the Velvet Underground. These were ways to continually kind of expand the influence for his ideas and for his penetration and to build, you know, he was unabashed in saying that he wanted to build a business around his art. Right. So certainly the idea of print editions, which uh, diversify the audience for art, are really important conceptually to the rest of Warhol's practice. How long did it take him to produce the series? You know, a series uh, in typically takes about a year from conception to publication. Uh, so probably about a year. But the silk screening itself, you know, once the uh, Warhol had a kind of hands off relationship with his silk screen printers, they may have come back to him with different variations for him to choose. But he loved this idea of chance and collaboration. So certainly his silkscreen printers would have also had a hand in um, kind of suggesting things, at least for Andy to follow and to incorporate. It's so interesting. What, you know, I was thinking that of each of these sitters, there's so many images of them. So I wonder how many. I mean, I guess we'll never know, but I wonder how many different images he was looking at for, let's say, Freud. Was there a smile? Was it a serious shot? And how many, you know, how many different images did he have to choose from? How did he, you know, choose an image? Is there any way anybody have any answer to that? Kafka well, looks, you it's know, a pretty famous Im image of Kafka, yeah. Uh, he, he had some assistants who worked very closely with him. Uh, unfortunately, as happens with everybody, they're getting older and they're kind of passed away, but they probably would have gone out and prepared for him uh, multiple images to select from. Or maybe in some cases, you know, Warhol was very well educated. He had a fantastic education 
at Carnegie Tech, now called Carnegie Mellon, which is a fine university. I'm proud to have gone there myself. And uh, Warhol learned a lot at Carnegie Tech. He learned a lot about history. He learned a lot about um, fine art, but also especially kind of cutting edge and contemporary art. So uh, Warhol comes to New York as a commercial artist, but he is very well immersed in a kind of classical education. It's, it seems like that, absolutely. And here's Golda smiling, but oftentimes, you know, she had the very, very serious shot of her, you know, especially during, um, you know, wartime, there were so many different shots that he could have chosen. Absolutely. It's interesting that he chose this one. It's a very warm shot and it looks like very warm colors. Well, and she looks not unlike Andy's mother, Julia. So uh, maybe that warmth and that slightly motherly quality from this great leader uh, would have appealed to him. But, you know, Warhol's mother was also pretty steely herself. She seemed like a, a kind of um, kind domestic lady, but she actually moved to New York, lived with him for 20 years, and was literally a collaborator in a lot of his work because she, when Andy moved to New York and became a commercial artist, there's a fair amount of calligraphy, or at least back then there was, in terms of these ads that he was producing. And he thought it was terribly boring. So he had his mother do all of the handwriting. And here you have these fancy editors at the New York Times and Harper's Bazaar saying, oh, Andy, your handwriting's so charming and witty. And I'm sure he said, thank you. But actually it's his mother, Julia, who never really mastered the English language, sitting there and laboriously uh, going through all of this handwriting and, uh, you know, kind of phonetically spelling out words. So uh, a motherly quality uh, would have been important to Warhol. And uh, as I say, uh, she, she does have a certain resemblance to Julia Warhol. Mother. Okay, I want to give us a few minutes for um, a couple of questions. Let me see. Um, okay, is, is Carol Gersten on? She was the one who was, is donating, or will be donating, I should say, her series. I don't know if she is on. Well, anyway, does anybody have any questions? for Patrick Moore, speak I'd up. Love to, I'd love to hear from people who are their favorites in the series and why. Somebody put in the chat who your favorite was in the series and why. I'll tell you, mine is the Marx Brothers. Uh -huh. And why, it was just a product of my childhood watching Duck Soup, Night at the Opera. I mean, it was such a, so, so, so much quality, so fun coming, you know, right on the heels of the, um, you know, the vaudeville and putting it into film and you see the absolute comedy mixed with the musical numbers. I don't know if you remember that, but it was just. Well, you're very young. I'm amazed that you even know who the Marx Brothers are. Come on, <laughs> come on. Either that or you've been staying out of that Florida sun. I'm out of the Florida sun. Yes, I am. Okay. But thank you for the compliment. You're welcome. I mean, for example, the Marx Brothers picture, I see, you know, now that we're talking about it, I see how it was the four different shots. Instead of one shot of them, you know, together as a group, it's them, but four times. Yeah. So do you think he was flowing with the energy and the excitement of them to create that? Well, it's an interesting thing to do a portrait of three people. And, you know, they didn't, they kind of had their roles within the Marx Brothers, but the um, they become something larger when they're together. They become the Marx Brothers rather than Harpo in this one and that right. one. So I, I think that the kind of multiplication of them 
was good and also it you know they were so zany so it kind of captures that idea of them bouncing around everywhere right the, that's what i thought instead of a serious i don't even know if they could make a serious photo that's right but you know it's it's uh and he did it in color of course and there is the comedy aspect i mean there's no way you can look at it and not think something uh entertaining is happening there that's right we have a question here from a viewer. She wants to know, um, is he, do you have a large collection at the museum of his original paintings? Yes, we do. We have the largest collection in the world. We have about 10,000 works of art in our collection. Um, a couple thousand of those are canvases, paintings. Uh, but we also have sculptures. We have an unbelievable section of Warhol's drawings. And then, um, interestingly, photographs. And a lot of people may not think of Warhol as a photographer, but especially later in his career, he not only used photographs to make silk screens, but he also had a kind of proper 8 by 10 black and white photography practice. So we're uh, having a discussion about having a large Warhol photography show here in a couple of years. But the collection is vast. Um, we've traveled it all over the world. More than 12 million people have seen um, exhibitions that originated from the Warhol here in Pittsburgh. And they have been literally, I think the only country we haven't been to perhaps is India. I don't think we've done anything in India. Do you have the full collection of the interview magazine? We do. In fact, we may have two, but we definitely have one. And in two years, maybe it's three years, we're going to be doing a uh, exhibition that's about interview. And um, that kind of visual style that was developed by Warhol around interview. But then also interview really represented in the clearest way, Warhol's social world, his social network in New York. So it's kind of a, uh, a view into Warhol's world. Okay. Are you thinking of digitizing interview at all? Well, we're thinking about digitizing everything, but we have 500,000 objects in our archival collection. So uh, I think that we have the covers of all of the interviews um, digitized, but I'm not sure that we currently have the um, contents, the in interior contents. To do this, because that would be an interesting way to do the digital sophistication. I would love to see that digitized. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people would be fascinated by it. Yeah. So no way that that's going to happen in the future for all of us. Well, uh, it probably will happen, but it may happen uh, after I'm retired as director and uh, happily sitting somewhere. Okay. We had a question about the rest, the people that were not, um, to our views, not shown today. You can look it up. Uh, we didn't put the full 10. We weren't sure how much time we were going to have, but you can look up um, anywhere online to get the full all the rest of the people that we didn't, you know, Sarah Bernhardt, Louis Brandeis, you can get those online. They're very, uh, uh, very easy to find. Just yeah, and the, um, the print edition, so each, each portfolio would have all 10 images and that would be sold as 10 images originally. But then over the years, of course, they've been broken up. People may say, oh, I love Sarah Bernhardt, but I don't really care so much about Brandeis. So I'm going to sell poor Brandeis and keep Sarah Bernhardt. So that's sort of the way these portfolios work is that they are sold as a unit, but then in the marketplace, they get diversified and broken up. Has that happened a lot? Do you see that come to auction? A lot yes. Of yes. And I, I was involved in a, a number of portfolios earlier in my career. For example, uh, I did a tribute portfolio to the great curator, Henry Geltzahler, and, uh, you know, it was Hockney and Louise Bourgeois and uh, all these fantastic people, James Rosenquist. So it was not very long, maybe six months or a year later, that I started to see those prints on an individual basis come into the marketplace. 
and it's probably that people kind of got them home and started hanging some of them and said, oh, I love these four, but the other ones I could live without. Uh, so that does happen really consistently with portfolios. So they were originally sold, you had to buy the series. Correct. The set when they were originally sold. Correct. Um, did, do you think Andy had any commentary on singles coming into the market? I mean, was he always for that it should be 10 sold together or was that more Feldman? Okay. That would have been, that would have been Feldman, but uh, no, I, I think that he would have, he was always happy when his work sold and sold well. So uh, I think that Warhol probably could have cared less if they were broken up. Okay. Um, I have a question here that said, Andy spent some time in Miami. Do you have anything in your collection that he did related to Miami? I can't think of an art object that's related to Miami. Um, so not so much, but Andy's gonna have a homecoming in Miami next spring because we're doing a really large and important uh, Warhol Marisol exhibition in partnership with the Perez Museum. So that exhibition opens, I believe, next March at the Perez, and then we'll come to Pittsburgh after that. So it'll be fun to uh, have Miami and Warhol come back together. Absolutely, looking forward to that. Uh, another question for you, it says, each one of the people featured was born in the 1800s. Was that by design? Or was it just coincidence? Well, uh, an interesting question. I honestly don't have the answer to it, but I would say that it was not by design, but maybe those were the people who had lived long enough and uh, kind of established themselves to have the gravitas that uh, Feldman wanted. Okay. So you feel like it was really Feldman driving this? I think that it was a Feldman project, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but um, especially because Feldman himself was Jewish. But uh, yeah, Feldman was the driver. Did he do any other complete series like this that were sold as a series? Mm -hmm. The myths, which we talked about a little bit, the cowboys and Indians, uh, which we mentioned, but he also did uh, print editions earlier, like in the late 60s, that were related to some of the really big, important images, like Maryland, there's a Maryland portfolio, flowers, there was a flowers portfolio. Um, so it was a way for Warhol to return to some of those really iconic early 60s paintings, and then um, kind of diversify the market for them later in the 60s. It's very interesting. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. This tour, this series has toured quite a bit, the 10 Jews. Yes. Uh, it went back to the Jewish Museum in, um, I think, in the maybe early 2000s. And, uh, but it's, yeah, it's been seen in a lot of places and it's widely beloved. Uh, people you know, despite it having a little bit of a rough uh, start, it, uh, it did very well later on with audiences. Good, okay, another question for you. How many different Marilyns did he create? Oh gosh, uh, it's, the answer is it's almost endless uh, because he did many, 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 many canvases and then he also did the print portfolio. But then on top of that, there were a lot of works on paper he made. And then we have a show that's traveling right now called Revelation that looks at uh, Warhol's Catholicism. And Warhol went back to the Maryland image and did it in kind of reverse black and white. They're called Maryland reversals. And they're very beautiful, but they're, it's as if the image has been so, has been looked at and focused and handled so much that it's almost burned out. The kind of Maryland is becomes sort of ghostly in these images. So he returned to that image again and again. Maybe his favorite image, if I had to pick one. 
Did he ever meet her? No. And what about Elvis? No. Uh, from those great early paintings, I would say the only person he not only met be, but became friends with was Jackie Kennedy. Really? Yeah. How many did he do of her? Uh, he did about, well, there's a silver, it's called, this, uh, there, there's an early, very colorful Jackie, but then later, and more importantly, really, are smaller canvases about like this. And he did hundreds of them of Jackie just after the assassination. Uh, when she was veiled, they're in kind of tones of blue and gray and silver. So they have this kind of elegiac mourning quality to, to her. Uh, he still at that point did not know her, but later on, uh, they were very much part of the same social world in New York and they met and we know that they became friends both from his diaries, but we have a rather astonishing object in our archives, which is a nude picture of Jackie Onassis as she was then known. And when she was uh, divorcing Aristotle Onassis, he thought he would humiliate her during the divorce process. Uh, she was nude sunbathing in Greece and he had a paparazzo photographer take her pic picture to sort of threaten her, like I'm gonna put this out. Um, she, because she was a great lady and didn't uh, care to be threatened, took the picture and made multiple copies of it and sent it to all of her friends and signed it, love Jackie. Wow. So she was not having it from Aristotle and Assis. She, uh, she gave it as good as she got. That's a really inspiring story. I'm so glad I heard that, <laughs> never known that. Yeah. Because she seems, you know, I don't wanna say conservative, but you know, I was asking if any of the, if any of these portraits were author, you know, authorized portraits. Yeah. Did she uh, sit for anything? No, th those early portraits were not authorized. Um, and it was pretty rare that somebody from those early iconic portraits would go back and have a kind of authorized or commissioned portrait uh, because they already had the great ones. They had the right. ones that Warhol had identified them as a cultural icon and he wanted to paint their paintings without a commission. All right. Such a fascinating story. So unfortunately, we're out of time. I could keep you all day, but uh, yeah. I really appreciate your coming on, Patrick, and it's been really a pleasure. Well, it's, it's fantastic to talk to you about this series, which uh, gets overlooked. And I'm so excited that it's going to come to you. So I salute your board member or your uh, supporter who is yes, going to make, yeah. make a nice donation to you. And I hope that you will enjoy it and share it with the community. You bet, you bet. All right, thank you so much. Again, I really appreciate your coming on. And for everybody, thank you for joining us today. It's really Lovely to speak pleasure. with you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.